Welcome everyone to Dismantling to Rebuild, replacing the Doctrine of Discovery in the 21st century with Sarah Augustine and Sophie Pierre. Uh, this is the second lecture in the Taking Action series. My name is Jameson Schultz Franco. I use pronouns he, him, or his, and I'm the social media and event coordinator with Resilience BC Anti-Racism Network. I'm a first generation occupier of color of uh, South Indian and German ancestry and born on the traditional territories of the Hussainich First Nations. Um, I'm joining you today from the stolen ancestral territory of the Musqueam Indian Band, the Stalo, Kikite and Selwatooth First Nations, Coast Salish peoples and the collection of nations that make up the Halkomenum Treaty Group. Uh, I share this verbal land acknowledgement with an understanding of how powerful a word acknowledgement really is and that accountability is really a key piece of acknowledging and walking in a good way on these lands. As Dr. Yerboam Gilpin Jackson puts it, it means saying yes up here, it means saying yes with your heart, and it means saying yes with your hands. And, and my verbal territory acknowledgement is my commitment to do that. That's also why I value so much being in space with my elders, Sophie Pierre, Sarah Augustine, Dr. Gilpin Jackson, and Parliamentary Secretary Singh. And this is also why I look forward to being in space, even virtually with folks who show up with the intent to learn how we can dismantle and rebuild. Before we get into the today's conversation though, I'd, I'd like to note a few housekeeping items. So closed captioning is available on Zoom by clicking that CC button at the bottom of your screen. So if you require ass assistance at any time, please feel free to privately message hosts and panelists Please note as well that this lecture is being recorded and will be available online after today's discussion. If and when questions arise for you, please feel free to submit them to the speakers using the Q&A function at any point during the event, whether it's during the lecture or the actual Q&A period. And uh, we will do our best to get to as many of them as we can. The reason that we're asking you to use this Q&A button is because the chat will remain closed until the Q&A portion of the event following Sarah Augustine's lecture and discussion with Sophie Pierre. So in the interest of keeping this space as safe as possible for folks, for all folks attending, uh, please respect our community guidelines, which are posted on, on this next slide and in the Zoom chat. Above all, there will be zero tolerance for those who promote violence or discrimination against others. Anyone who incites harm towards other participants in the chat will be removed at the discretion of the event hosts. Um, I think it's really important to be clear of, of that when holding space for and, and with each other in conversations like these. So now to set some context for all those who are joining today's space, uh, the Taking Action Lecture Series is a part of a partnership between SFU and the Resilience BC Anti-Racism Network. So the network is, uh, is a network funded by the province made up of over 30 nonprofit organizations doing work in communities across what is colonially known as BC. The network looks to stay connected support wise and information wise and offer trainings to permit to prevent to prevent excuse me and respond to incidences of racism and hate you can learn more about the resilience bc anti-racism network at our website which is actually available in 13 languages and we have some tools that are available for folks to start on or continue on your anti-racism learning journey you can also pick resources according to your learning style which i find very very helpful videos podcasts interactive websites and so we invite you to check those out in the taking action lectures we hear from activists from around the world sharing their successes and strategies for effective anti-racism work going beyond simply identifying the problems of racism colonialism hate and discrimination these lectures focus on ways we can adapt these strategies to take a decolonized approach to anti-racism work in communities across bc so today is the second lecture in the series. For the first lecture, we heard from Dr. Eva Jewell, the research director of Yellowhead Institute on structural racism and personal embodiment of anti-oppressive practices on the ongoing commitment of reconciliation. So links to videos and resources from that lecture will be dropped in the chat. So to open our proceedings today, I would like to introduce you to BC's Parliamentary Secretary for Anti-Racism Initiatives, and MLA for the Surrey Green Timbers, Rajna Singh. As MLA, uh, P.S. Singh was elected in 2017 and re-elected in 2020, yet her work ripples across communities all across these lands. 
P.S. Singh played a key role as a member of the Special Committee on Reforming the Police Act, who actually just released the report on transforming policing and community safety in BC. Rachna moved from India to Canada in 2001 and brings a vast amount of personal and professional lived experience to the space. She has worked as a drug and alcohol counselor, a support worker for women facing domestic violence, and a community activist. She has also worked to improve workers' rights as a representative with the Canadian Union of Public Employees. P.S. Singh, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much, Jamison. Always such a pleasure. Uh, and uh, I really want to thank you for your kind words. Uh, I am uh, very honored to be joining you from the shared territories of the Samiamu, Katsi, Quiquetlam, Kwantlan, Kikite, and Swasan First Nations. I really want to thank you, uh, thank uh, the SFU Public Care and Resilience BC Anti-Racism Network for your work in organizing today's lecture. Uh, and I want to recognize the importance of conversations. Uh, I know we are going to hear uh, from uh, the conversations that are going to be led by uh, Sarah Augustine and former chief Sophie Peer. Today's lecture is on dismantling to rebuild, and I know I play a role within this as an elected official working with an anti-racism mandate in a colonial government. This is a deep and complex work, but a challenge that I'm committed to taking on. I want to take a moment to share a little bit about the work that we are doing through government as we seek to address systemic racism in British Columbia. And I'm very proud to see that Resilience BC is involved in this event. Our government launched Resilience BC in 2019 to ensure that we are investing in communities across BC to fight racism in a coordinated way. In addition to this, our government is also taking actions through initiatives like the Multiculturalism and Anti-Racism Grant Programs, Public Awareness Campaigns, and developing a K-12 Anti-Racism Action Plan. Recently, as Jameson mentioned, the Special Committee on Reforming the Police Act also tabled its report after conducting its review, uh, the role of police with respect to mental health, harm reduction, and systemic racism. Our government is currently reviewing those recommendations. As you are likely aware, earlier this month, our government also introduced the Anti-Racism Data Act. The act supports the collection of demographic data, for example, information about identity, ethnic background, or age. Government at this time collects some of this data, uh, but there are gaps. And this legislation will support more consistent collection of data and help us identify where racism exists in government systems, programs, and services. This is a critical information uh, as we work on combating racism and making programs better for everyone. Over the last year, uh, I've had the opportunity to work closely with indigenous peoples and racialized communities to build trust and make sure that those who are already affected by systemic racism are not further harmed by, by this legislation. And we recently invited all British Columbians to provide their input through an online engagement. The survey asked for their thoughts on how government should collect data and how they would like to identify, as well as their experiences of using government programs. We also provided funding to almost 70 community organizations to lead their own engagement. And we have worked closely with First Nations and Métis leadership to make sure their input is reflected in this legislation. One of the first to be co-drafted under, under the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act. Overall, more than 13,000 people provided their thoughts on this legislation. One of the most extensive engagements the province has ever done for a historic piece of legislation. But we are not done yet. Uh, we will work, we will continue our work with indigenous peoples and racialized communities on exactly how and what statistical information uh, will be collected and how it will be shared and protected as we implement this act. And we are turning our minds next to developing a broader anti-racism act that we hope to introduce in 2023. There's much more going on, but uh, what I've shared with you so far is a snapshot of the work that our government is doing to tackle systemic racism in our province. We recognize that as government, we continue to work with a legacy of colonization and discrimination against indigenous and racialized com communities. And we are committed to ensure we are working together as we work to make BC a more equitable, inclusive and welcoming place for everyone. Once again, I again want to thank you all for having me and uh, really looking forward, forward to the lecture today. Thank you so much.
Thank you very much, Pia Singh, for that snapshot and for, for naming a lot of those things that you just named. Thank you. And thank you for being here today as well. Next, I would like to introduce Dr. Yobom Gilpin Jackson. In January 22, Dr. Gilpin Jackson was named SFU's first vice president of people, equity, and inclusion. Yobom is an award winning organizational development leader and scholar who centers equity, diversity, and inclusion in all she does. Throughout her career, which has spanned the public, private, and nonprofit sectors, she has helped people and organizations build capacity for transformational change. As mentioned in her TEDx talk, How to Get Past Its Connection to Social Change, Dr. Gilpin Jackson brings her mind, her heart, and her hands to this work. This rings true as communities across these lands learn from her on how to advance EDI and belonging in workplaces and society. Yabom is an SFU alumnus, as well as an associate professor in the BD School of Business. She is also the founder of Supporting Learning and Development Consulting, Inc. Dr. Gilpin Jackson, thank you for your presence here today. Thank you so much, Jimison, and thank you. Uh, a heartfelt gratitude to you, Private Manager Secretary Singh, for having joined us today. And just a huge shout out for all your work, which is setting so many strong foundations for all of us in the province as we move forward um, with this mandate for equity and anti-racism, um, specifically as, um, as we step into this conversation today. And I wanna, before I go any further, I want to acknowledge that I am joining today from the traditional um, unceded and still occupied territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Coquitlam um, peoples. It is my pleasure to bring you greetings from President Joy Johnson and the executive of Simon Fraser University. We are privileged and grateful to be partners with the Resilience BC Network to have these opportunities to create space for learning together to stretch all of us, and in particular, to stretch all of us towards action, uh, to integrate, uh, as uh, Jameson knows, and, and mentioned about my work, to integrate head, heart, and hands. Um, well, I firmly believe that it is not enough for us to just raise our consciousness on this work. It is not enough for us to um, be in reaction and take token actions. What we need is a deep level of consciousness um, is a measured consideration of actions that build towards sustainable transformation and a commitment to take that action over time. So whether you're joining today um, and you're in what feels sometimes like the very slow work of transformation towards an equity-centered future, um, or whether you're in the midst of, of action that feels meaningful and um, supportive and, and is moving forward quickly towards that future that we are creating now. Um, I just invite you today to listen deeply. What a treat uh, to have um, the conversation that we're about to step into with, with Sarah and Dr. Pierre. So thank you for your presence here on behalf of SFU. Um, I think the very um, notion that we are partnering with Resilience BC, that we are hosting this conversation through SFU Public Square is as a signal of our commitment. My role, I, I wish I had a fancy framework to share with you of what SFU is up to <laughs> with, with equity. I don't have that yet. Um, I have just arrived, I was announced in January and just arrived in the role within the month. However, what's important about all of that is, is um, the core of the conversation, Sarah, that you're about to host with us, which is putting action behind our intentions, one building block at the time, at a time. And I, I want to say um, personally how grateful I am to have both of you host this conversation. Sarah, your notion about dismantling to rebuild touched me very deeply and personally. I talk often about the fact that we cannot only focus on dismantling. And yes, we have to stand for anti-racism. However, we must also stand for what we're building. We must also stand for belonging, um, building a world of belonging for all. Um, I, I have the um, famous story uh, behind Mother Teresa's um, response to being asked to go march for the Vietnam War, where, where she said some version of, um, um, I won't come to stand against the war effort, but I will come to stand for peace. 
And I believe that we really must do both. We must dismantle, dismantle and we should clear eyed, be present to what it is we're building. Um, and I'll just also comment before I turn it over to Jameson, who I know will introduce both of you more fully, um, but wanted to comment on the fact that, um, on what really touched me about the way you describe the doctrine of discovery, which everyone here is about to hear, as a theological, philosophical, and legal framework that gave Christian governments the moral and legal right to invade and seize indigenous lands and dominate indigenous peoples, setting the stage for colonization, as well as the enslavement of African people by Europeans. Um, while I, I stand as an ally who is, is a, a newcomer and settler to these lands, um, that statement really touched me coming from a native land where I am an indigenous Africa, African, um, in a space that experienced different levels of settler colonialism and then ultimately neocolonialism um, that continues to impact the country of my heritage today. Um, from all the perspectives you raise, including faith perspective, coming from an interfaith family and all of that. So just to everyone, I'll encourage you to um, be present with head, hands and heart. Um, uh, Dr. Priyar, again, congratulations on your honorary uh, Doctor of Laws um, from Simon Fraser University. And I mean, so much to say about that but even your presence here um, honoring us with hosting this conversation says it all <laughs> about why um, that matters so much to, to recognize the work that you have done leading us on this journey to equity and reconciliation in the province. So th thank you both for being here on behalf of Simon Fraser University. I'll turn it over to Jim and Sien, who will more fully introduce you and I'll be here in the background. Thank you, Dr. Gilpin Jackson. I appreciate you grounding this conversation today and in, in your lived experience and wisdom. Thank you. Next, I have the, the pleasure of introducing Sarah Augustine. Uh, Sarah is a Tewa descendant chair of the Dismantling the Doctrine of Discovery Coalition and the executive director of a dispute resolution center in the middle of what is colonially known as Washington State. This center, as well as Sarah's home, is located within the confederated bands and tribes of the Yakama Nation. She is also the co-founder of the Suriname Indigenous Health Fund, where she has advocated for vulnerable Indigenous peoples since 2004. She has represented the interests of Indigenous community partners to their own governments, the United Nations, the World Health Organization, and more. Sarah is a columnist for Anabaptist World and co-hosts the Dismantling the, Dis the Doctrine of Discovery podcast with Sherry Hostetler. She is author of the book, The Land is Not Empty, Following Jesus and Dismantling the Doctrine of Discovery, published by Herald Press in 2021. And I think you'll be joining in conversation with Sophie Pierre about this in a little while. But first, I just want to say, Sarah, it's an honor to be in space with you today. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here. Um, and I just want to thank, extend thanks to all who have made it possible and who have invited me to be here. Um, I'm sharing this evening as a representative of the Dismantling the Doctrine of Discovery Coalition, and I'm speaking to you from the homeland of the Confederated Bands and Tribes of the Yakima Nation in what is now called Central Washington State. And I want to acknowledge the Yakima people, my neighbors and hosts who have safeguarded this land and its sacred waters for countless generations. My grandmother was a woman of the round earth from the Nambe Pueblo in what is now known as Northern New Mexico. Her son, my father, was taken away from her and her lands and family and people at the time of his birth. While I'm a displaced person, I claim the lineage of my grandmother, a Tewa woman, and with humility stand in the line of her descendants today. And it's such a privilege to be invited to share with you this evening Thank you for trusting me to share with you in the Taking Action speaker series to share about peace today and to talk about justice, which is a requirement of peace. I wanna just quickly go over some of the things I wanna talk with you about this evening. I wanna start with talking about the nature of reality. And I'll talk a little bit about what the doctrine of discovery is. I wanna introduce the idea of dismantling systems, and also the idea of rebuilding systems and creating systems. 
I want to share actions that work and have worked um, within our coalition uh, to dismantle colonization and racism and actions that could save the world. So let's get started. I want to begin by sharing an Indigenous worldview as it's been taught to be by my elders. The truth that is evident in creation. An esteemed elder, Sophie Pierre, once said to me that before we can make progress in decolonizing systems, we must first speak the truth. So I want to share here what I have seen. In the environment where I live on 200 acres of habitat in the foothills of Pato, the sacred mountain of the region, I see the faithfulness of the creator with each season. In spite of all efforts to thwart it, efforts like the application of toxic pesticides and herbicides and large scale dumping of nitrates each spring, life returns to the soil, trees and plants flower, pollinators do their important work to spread the miracle of life. I live in a reality dependent upon balance, a reality of cycles. For my family to thrive here, for our gardens to feed us, for our livestock to thrive, the plants and animals we live with side by side must also thrive. We are embedded in a web of mutual dependence. Each morning at dawn, I acknowledge my dependence to the rising sun, acknowledgement my people have practiced for untold generations. The Yakima people, my neighbors and hosts, practice reverence when they acknowledge this life web in their spring feast. They give thanks before they go out to gather. Think about Thanksgiving, this holiday. It's a holiday to commemorate what has been taken. But the Yakima give thanks before they gather. The elders instruct us, take just what you need and leave plenty for future generations. On the ranch where I live, I harvest golden currants and elderberries each year and choke cherries, which I use to make juice and jelly. These are native plants in the, in the region. If I wanted to be efficient, I could strip the plants of every single berry and have an abundance of juice in my pantry that might last for I don't know, years. Instead, I take just what I, my son and husband will use for the year and leave the majority to the community of birds who share this land. They then are able to seed new plants as they fly overhead, propagating abundance, increasing the yield by seeding additional plants. We learn from creation the processes of life, the nature that is self-evident in the spirit of life, and our place in it. The Yakima say this, when the hunter climbs to track his prey, he knows his brother waits for him. We are connected. The survival of one determines the survival of the other. The prey is not objectified or subdued. The sacrifice is honored. The nature of reality that I have learned from my elders is at odds with the reality and the narrative of the dominant culture. I have been taught by my elders that we live in a closed system of mutual dependence. What is a closed system? It's a physical system that does not allow transfer of matter in or out. In other words, in the closed system of our earth, there is no new water or air or soil. The life support systems of earth are fixed. The earth is all we have and we are mutually dependent. What one does impacts every other. This is in stark contrast to what I've learned from the dominant culture. The dominant narrative says that progress is linear in time and evidenced by accumulation. In this view, the earth is characterized as a set of raw resources to extract in service to a project called progress. Success is the accumulation of wealth, power, and security. Each individual amasses these things for himself or for herself within her lifetime. A successful life is one evidenced by taking more than one share and amassing resources. In an indigenous cosmology, or anyhow, the one that I've been taught, the elders instruct us, take just what you need and leave plenty for future generations. The dominant vision of progress 
is imbued with the logic of extraction, taking what I want to fulfill my wishes from the earth, which is perceived as an object or a series of commodities. Extraction is rooted in the concept of dominion and domination and is justified by the notion of perpetual growth, which is the basis for capitalism. Extractive logic threatens every system of life on the earth through the pollution of air, water, and soil. Indigenous cosmology does not view the earth as a multitude of commodities to exploit. Rather, the earth is a living system made up of living systems to dis of distinct living beings. The Mayan community I am currently in relationship with argues in defense of their homeland. The sacred water they defend is a sacred being with whom they are in relationship. It is not a resource to be exploited or conserved. It's not a resource at all. It's a being. Applying extractive logic to complex problems like climate change results in unviable solutions that are not consistent with the principles of life. Technological solutions alone will not heal creation, end climate change, or dismantle oppressive systems because accumulation and perpetual growth are still the desired outcomes. When reducing carbon is the goal, extractive logic is ready to sacrifice one life support system for another. While mining endangers soils, aquifers, and community health for indigenous and vulnerable peoples around the globe, it will be amplified in the rush to identify what are termed sustainable sources of energy. Mining industry specialists note that significant growth of low carbon technologies such as wind turbines and electric vehicles should boost demand for the raw materials needed for those technologies. As the global electrification of industries continues, electric vehicles and batteries will create growth markets for cobalt, lithium, and nickel. So these are these um, optimistic words coming from the mining industry. The International Energy Agency states, clean energy technologies generally require more minerals than fossil fuel-based counterparts. An electric car uses five times as much minerals as a conventional car, and an onshore wind plant requires eight times as much minerals as a gas-fired plant of the same capacity. Even in fossil fuel-based technologies, achieving higher efficiency and lower emissions relies on the extensive use of minerals. For example, the most efficient coal-fired power plant requires a lot more nickel than the least efficient ones in order to allow for higher combustion temperatures. European settlers on this continent believe land should be used for the highest and best use. The idea of highest and best use was coined by early economists and is found as early as in the Maine legislature in 1831, where it was used to refer to the assessment of real estate. The technical definition is used in, in property evaluation, and it is reasonably possible, appropriately supported, and financially feasible that result in the highest economic value. Land as a commodity, not the source of life. Extractive logic is inconsistent with the terms of reality. During the settlement of North America, lands not under a process of extraction or commodification were considered empty. This model followed to a logical conclusion has resulting, resulted in alarming signs of climate change. As a species, we humans now find ourselves grappling with the choice. Will we follow a path of rational analysis and consensus building or follow the biological model of species extinction? The causes of extinction, according to biologists, um, for all life forms are loss and degradation of habitat, including deforestation, over-exploitation, climate change, ocean acidification, and nitrogen pollution. Humans now face all of these conditions today. What do we sacrifice on the altar of our financial security? We have collectively invested in a death machine, linear, reductive, destructive, a machine that destroys air, water, and soils, the life support systems all of creation depend upon. And what does this death machine give us? 
profit, money that provides a short-term luxury and short-term security. Does this death machine cooperate with the principles of reality? The indigenous peoples I've grown to know in Suriname, South America, and that I talk about quite a lot in my book, The Land is Not Empty, they do not have land rights because of the doctrine of discovery. Although resource extraction, including mining, badly contaminates the lands where they live, international mining companies have the right to extract resources that put toxins like mercury and cyanide in the water, soil, and ecosystem. The doctrine of discovery is a current legal doctrine in North America that defines reality for indigenous peoples. And actually it's a legal doctrine around the world, but we're here in North America. So we'll talk about it in that context. A legal doctrine is more than a law. The doctrine of discovery is not a law. It is a framework or a process for creating, establishing and evaluating law. So we're not talking about some antiquated thing that happened long, long ago. We're talking about the legal structure that forms reality for indigenous peoples and all of us today. I wanna talk now about dismantling systems. And to begin, I wanna say that decolonization is climate justice. And there is no climate justice without decolonization. Colonization introduced extractive logic because it is based on extractive logic. Thinking we can end climate change without ending extractive logic result in actions that promote more extraction, such as increasing mining, and further endanger our life support systems. Because extractive logic is inconsistent with the reality that we live in and in, that we live in, which is a closed system of mutual dependence, um, it is doomed. So we decolonize for our own survival and decolonization is not a symbolic act. Decolonization is not a metaphor. It means relinquishing control of a subjugated people. It means identifying, challenging, revising, and replacing assumptions, ideas, values, and practices that reflect a colonizer's dominating influence. For the coalition, this means seeking sovereignty for indigenous peoples, that is affirming the rights of indigenous peoples to self-governance and struggling with indigenous peoples for this sovereignty. It also means land return, returning traditional lands to indigenous peoples. I say again, solidarity is not symbolic. For example, it is petitioning the Department of the Interior to require indigenous approval of all federal land use permits, where every fracking permit granted in Canada must be approved by the First Nations most affected. What impact might that have on drilling and fracking? To make this happen, it means getting on the phone with your friends, coworkers, neighbors, and family members, and encouraging them to get on the phone to their legislators, set up meetings, write editorials, use all the leverage at your disposal to push forward this agenda. We must seek systems, build systems that seek repair. And this starts with truth telling. Institutions often want to apologize to start and end with an apology as though a fleeting discourse they control exonerates them from taking responsibility for changing systems. Apology can't be the beginning because reconciliation or the restoration of friendly relations cannot occur without conciliation or the action of stopping harm and seeking mediation between the one who committed harm and the injured party. The first step in repair is to take responsibility, to tell the truth, to listen to truth telling and to admit what happened, to take responsibility for the damage that has occurred. The most effective way to transfer trauma is silence. The first step in stopping the transfer of trauma is to tell the truth. The second step is to actively seek repair. Words are not enough. Systems are created to unfairly benefit one group over another and variables must change for the system to change. 
Often these variables are policies and laws that intentionally harm indigenous peoples and separate them from their traditional lands. The most effective way to transform trauma is conflict resolution, stepping into conflict and finding mutual resolution. This act is humanizing and it takes as long as it takes. Some institutions and even people avoid conflict resolution because it means facing anger. But anger is an expression of worthiness. Anger is the beginning of ascent from damage to transforming trauma. The third step of seeking repair. Once relationship is established and repair is embarked upon, only then is it time for apology. Osage theologian and scholar George Tinker says, we will accept your apology when you give us our land back. I wanna now talk about some systems of repair in my experience, um, the TRC of Canada, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. It began with truth telling and it was led by indigenous peoples for indigenous peoples. There are 94 calls to action um, that are stated, which include reducing indigenous children in care which means ending removal of indigenous children from their kin and their homelands, bringing an end to re erasure in the education system, decolonizing health systems and criminal justice systems, and creating a pathway toward reconciliation by adopting the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, just to name a few. I'd like to talk for a moment about the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. This declaration sets out to, to create the minimum standards necessary for the dignity, survival, and well being of Indigenous peoples. It too is created by Indigenous peoples for Indigenous peoples. It is a body of policy that was created by Indigenous peoples, and it is the body of policy we should step into and adopt as we're trying to identify just policy on behalf of Indigenous peoples. It was created to be adopted by UN member states, and it should be adopted as a constitutional amendment and therefore made supreme law. Creating a new land tenure structure and eradicate, eradicating the current structure is what would occur if we adopted the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples within our constitutional structures. The United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues is another structure that was created by Indigenous peoples for Indigenous peoples. It's a place to organize and work together. An elder that I respect, Kevin Deere, is currently proposing that the UN recognize tribes as nations with the privileges of all sovereign nations and with the status of nations in the UN system, where they would be peers and equals to, um, to other nations at the UN. I also want to name our Dismantling the Doctrine of Discovery Coalition. At our coalition, our work is twofold. We partner and co-create relationship with First Peoples in campaigns that they lead. We stand together because our survival is interdependent um, as leaders and earth protectors and experts in their own environments and our own environments. Indigenous peoples must identify outcomes that are appropriate in their own, in our own communities. The coalition assists as partners and co-conspirators in the struggle for life, not as helpers or service providers. The second tier that we do, the second role that we have in the coalition is to take responsibility. So the systems built by our society that benefit us are our responsibility to dismantle. As Christians, we acknowledge the doctrine of discovery is a Christian concept of domination that threatens indigenous peoples, their lands and all of creation. And it is our work to dismantle it. In the church, what is done in the name of Christ must be undone in the name of Christ. And the doctrine of discovery and dismantling it falls to people who are in the church today. The church is responsible for decolonization and must do this collectively as an institution. So I also wanna share some actions and tactics that work um, in, in service to decolonization and in building um, new institutions um, that ref reflect reality 
and the systems of life. The first is building movements, not institutions. This boils down to meat and potatoes organizing everywhere and all the time. We bring this with us to our jobs, our churches, our friends, our soccer teams, happy hour, the brunch crowd, because structures are integrated and multi-layered. Activism is not a thing that I do. It is a central part of my identity and who I am. This work is collective work. It is not individual work. Recycling will not fix this. Carpooling won't fix it. In fact, this is not about me and it's not about you alone. It's about so much more. It's about us. We have to work for change collectively, change that you may not see in your lifetime. And the fact that you may not see it in your lifetime does not diminish the significance of the work or your contribution to it. We're organizing a repair network of congregations across the United States and Canada. Congregations are effective because these are groups of people who share values, who are rooted in communities, working alongside people that they know um, on both the local and systemic levels. We also identify targets and frame tactics around those targets instead of virtue signaling. So for example, we are looking for policy targets and we are, and we are um, employing tactics to move um, our agenda forward on those policy targets. For example, we brought human rights language into the NECA Act, which is legislation that was passed in 2019 in the United States. And we're able to contribute human rights language to the NECA Act in partnership with the Mosquito people by identifying the appropriate Senate committee, recruiting allies from appropriate constituents, and getting on airplanes to meet with decision makers who were already contemplating legislation. We were looking for opportunities, aware of legislation in play, and poised to organize when we had the opportunity. This is multi-generational work. You are the representative of your ancestors and you are alive now. You can show up on their behalf now. Your elders know stuff. I'm here today because of two courageous women who passed their mantles on to me. Tanya Fritchner, one of the creators of the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, and Maria Chavez, who worked at the World Council of Churches and told me my contribution was enough, that just by showing up, I had earned the right to write the statement repudiating the doctrine of discovery on behalf of 350 global churches because I was ready and willing and able to recruit indigenous leaders to help me. You are the example to the ones that will come after you. Your example demonstrates how to live with courage. You are creating the scaffolding for the world that they will carry on. We have to give them hope and preparation and we do this with ourselves and our lives. I realize I'm out of time, but I just have a, just a few more things that I wanna say. A respected international leader at an international church gathering once told me, we can't be sidelined by one issue because we need to focus on peace. This was his response when I asked the coalition of historic peace churches to advocate for dismantling the doctrine of discovery at the international level. I responded to him that we are not an issue, but a people with a message of hope for humanity. In spite of the current political reality that surrounds us, we can't be deceived that we are somehow in a battle with those we perceive to be our enemies. There is only one side and that is the side of creation. There is only one reality and it is defined by the principles of life. Anything that runs counter to these principles is doomed to fail. All things must come together to support life. Slowly, one by one and in twos, we come together and converge. We are made to do this. Instructions are in the very fabric of our DNA and we must choose life. The systems of death seem eternal and universal, but they do not conform to the logic of life and therefore they will be broken down and composted as all things must that tend toward death. It's human to breathe the air and to dwell in the land, to need water and nourishment, all of us will tend toward systems that enable these things ultimately. It is human to work together, to possess dignity, to speak and be heard. It is human to be touched, to be loved, to feel sympathy, camaraderie, to experience forgiveness and compassion. 
Our fragile bodies require that we cooperate to survive, and these tools are ours by birthright. All of us are drawn to systems that enable these things. And the way of life cannot be thwarted. It is the only reality for all of us. Because we do not see success in our own lifespan is no reason to despair. The great unknown unfolds itself over millennia across an ever-expanding universe. Your presence, the truth that runs through your veins, through the ancient chain of your ancestors bears testament to this truth. Do not be afraid to step into the fray. The ever unfolding process of life, the spirit of life is a power with no end and cannot be overcome. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you for your very rich sharing. I am sitting in the words that you are sharing of your ancestors and so many pieces of wisdom that you've shared in the last 30 minutes. I, I thank you for your, um, your kindness and sharing. As we move forward in this uh, conversation today, it feels fitting that we are joined by uh, incredibly respected leader, human being and elder advisor, Sophie Pierre. Sophie is an accomplished indigenous leader, distinguished for her resilience and commitment to First Nations economic development. She served on the council of the St. Mary's Indian Band now known as a come of the Katunaha Nation for 30 years, 26 of those as elected chief. She also served as chief commissioner of the BC Treaty Commission from 2009 to 2015. She was recognized with the Order of Canada in 2016, the Order of British Columbia in 2002, and the National Aboriginal Achievement Award in the business category in 2003. She was also awarded an honorary doctorate of laws from Simon Fraser University in 2020. Since her retirement in 2015, she was recognized in BC Business Magazine as one of the top 50 most influential women in BC. She now spends her time as an elder advisor to her community and to the Katunaha Nation. Sophie, thank you for sharing your time and your spirit with us today. Thank you, Jameson. And thank you, Sarah. That was um, incredible. And it just carries on with um, the teaching that, that you have passed on to me and I'm, I'm very grateful for that. I'll start off my comments by acknowledging and thanking the Parliamentary Secretary Singh and um, Doctor and Vice President at Simon Fraser, of which I can now proudly say that I am an alumni, <laughs> uh, Jill Pim Jackson. Uh, what an honor to, to meet the both of you and to have you join us in this discussion. I bring you greetings. I bring you greetings from Amak Eskutunaka. I am just outside of Cranbrook in my community of Akam. And um, I am in the middle of our homelands, our uh, Amak Eskutunaka. And uh, I am, I live in Akam, but I am Kutunaka. Kutunaka are on both sides of the border as many, many indigenous nations are. You know, we've got this 49th parallel that came, came along and you know, two separate uh, entities that with the blessing of the doctrine of discovery, put in a 49th parallel and uh, divided our people in, into two. Said that you know, half of the, well, depending on, and it really depended on just where our families happened to be at the time that the 30, the, 49th parallel was put in there. I have no idea what happened on the 39th parallel, but I probably something similar. <laughs> the 49th parallel. You know, so if, if some of our families happened to be in the south of our, our traditional homelands, then they became American. And my family happened to be up, um, you know, in the, in the northern part, closer to the, the um, where the, the mighty Columbia River starts. And uh, so here we are, we're Canadian. But regardless, we are, first and foremost, always Ktunaha. Sarah, the, the, the um, information that you've given us in, in the last half hour, and, and also in your book, I loved your book, and I really encourage um, everyone to, that, that has an interest and that wants to understand the doctrine of discovery to, um, to read Sarah's book. The... Um, you, you started off and you talked about the truth and how that was so important. Um, you know, that because, because I mean, here in Canada, as you mentioned, we have the Truth and Reconciliation 
um, commission that that made the recommendations, but the Canadian government's um, reaction to that and the Canadian, the general public, including like it, it's right throughout industry, everyone, people are wanting to immediately jump to reconciliation. Okay, how can we fix this without ever really knowing why? You have to know the truth. Why? Why is it that we're here? Because otherwise, you're you're only going to put um, you know a coat of paint over the top of it. You're not actually going to fix it. So, and it was it's very important that that we open that way. You know that that and that we are very open about what the truth is. <clears throat> in the last couple of days, um, I was involved in a meeting with our elders, and we were talking about. Um, and I noticed in the question that, uh, or in the question and chat, uh, that there was a, a question that was raised about how we now have the recognition of our own laws, uh, because right now there's an opportunity through Bill C-92, which is the recognition of the child and family laws by, you know, Canada has this, this act that they have, they're putting out there that First Nations now can have their, their child and family um, or, or the recognition of, of their laws um, and jurisdiction in that. But it's still coming from that idea that, you know, somehow the federal government has this authority to allow us to do this. When we have always done this, we've always had laws. And mm -hmm. so, yes, you know, now the discussion is how, how do we get these laws recognized? And so the discussion that we were having we're talking about the imp you know the the long term impact starting from the um, doctrine of discovery and sort of culminating right now in the discussion we have around colonization and you know when we when we use that word there's almost like um, a finality about it like okay you know we've been colonized you know there, then we've got all these problems and really one of um, one of the elders had um, mentioned that they call it it's not it's not just colonization, like that, that's kind of one description of it, but it was only an interruption. And that's where, that's where it, that's the way that we have to look at this. It was mm. simply an interruption. Mm. So, you know, when we're, when we're talking about um, getting an apology from the Pope, I mean, <laughs> we had to ask for that apology, I don't know how many times, you know, so, and how, how can that be for real if you have to ask for it over and over and over again? So, you know, and that was just to recognize the impact of residential schools on Indigenous children. Um, can you imagine what it would, what it's going to take to get an apology from the Pope or even a, an acknowledgement <laughs> on the doctrine <laughs> of discovery? But hmm. if anybody can do it, Sarah, you can. <laughs> you know, you can lead the next uh, the next delegation <laughs> to get an apology from the Pope. <laughs> so, you know, I speak only for myself, Sophie, but yeah. I, I would say if I had an audience with the Pope, I would say, um, sir, mm -hmm. um, keep your apology. You're the, the, the yeah. Catholic Church is the largest landowner on earth. Um, yeah. What we would like is land. Yes. Exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, or exactly. Like yeah. Because really, what does an apology? What what is the significance of that? You know, for me, it doesn't it does it doesn't have a significance personally for me. Um, but I, I just thought that that would be a, kind of an interesting, <laughs> an interesting <laughs> next next challenge. <laughs> that let's we have. go together. Yes, and, let's go. <laughs> um, but, you know, the the as um, as I was um, sharing my experience with you when when we first met, and I talked about what our people, what the Kanaka, um, what we have done, and we have done this as a um, as a choice. It was a choice of our people to take something that is a result of the doctrine of discovery. You know the residential schools and the whole systems and everything that came out of what happened in residential schools. Here in, in Amak Esk our Ktunaka and the Shushwap Indian Band, the people that, that are here in our territory with us, we made the decision that we would take that, that former residential school, after it had been shut down for about 20 years and it was in total um, disrepair. I mean, it, it was really starting to uh, look pretty ugly 
And it kind of was a, a, a really good example of just how we were feeling about what happened with the residential schools. We had one of our elders that said that if we thought that we had lost so much within that residential school to go back in there and get it. And we, I mean, you look at this building, it's falling down, it's ugly. And we thought like, what is she talking about? Eventually we figured out what she was talking about and we took that, um, we made the choice. Nobody else made it for us. Nobody came along and said, this is a good idea. This is what you should do. It was our people ourselves. We made the choice that we would turn a former Indian residential school that had so much negative and everything around it was negative and that we would take that back so that we are not continued victims from this, mm -hmm. from what happened in that place, that we would take that back, that it's ours. We will take that back and we will change it. We will mm -hmm. move forward. And I think that that's one of the ways, you know, when we start talking about um, dismantling um, the doctrine of discovery, dismantling really the effects of it is what we're talking about. And because it may have happened back in the 1400s uh, as a papal, uh, started out as a papal bull, but, you know, it, it has very direct effects on us now. Mm. And if we just stay in that place where we are talking about constantly about the effects instead of about how we actually dismantle it. And one of the ways that we have done here is with what I uh, shared with you about what we have done with a former residential school that was called Kootenai Indian Residential School. I personally spent nine years in that residential school, but um, today it is a resort. It, and it's a going concern right now. It's, it's full. We got a, the, the whole hotel and the, the RV park, everything is going to be full this coming up weekend. And like, it's something we have turned that around and we have made it into something positive for our future. So that is the experience that we have. And, you know, when we talk about that, um, you know, it, it falls in with, it's not, uh, it's not at the international level of work that you're doing, but it is at the um, sort of the, the, the bricks and, you know, the, the laying of the foundation, you know, of how we, mm -hmm. we go about um, the work in, in dismantling. Yes, and to me, that is such a powerful story. And I'm glad that you've shared it, Sophie, because it is an expression of sovereignty at every yeah. level. So this is um, a sovereign nation that cannot be given yeah. dignity, right? This is a sovereign nation right. who is imbued with dignity. It's a dignity yeah. as a birthright, who um, is, you know, is simply not constrained or prevented from following uh, it's, uh, it's, it's own life way. And I yeah. think, um, you know, it, it's also such a, a beautiful expression of, um, of seeking life and growth, you know, sort of in the ashes that it's, it's possible to, um, to embody that, um, that growth. And I think that um, folks who are wanting to, to come along and accompaniment and who are talking about solidarity, solidarity is joining the people in their own work because mm -hmm. um, uh, they don't need help. We don't need help, we need relatives, right? So yes. we want to yes, uh, work that. together yeah. To, yeah. Um, to live into reality as it is. And I love what you said about um, mm -hmm. colonization is an interruption. When I used to teach uh, sociology at Heritage University here uh, on the Yakima lands, um, I would draw a, a line on the chalkboard and say, um, let's imagine this is 10,000 years of um, human beings similar to ourselves, You know, 10,000 years of language with humans. Mm -hmm. How much of this line would be um, universal electrification in North America? 70 years, you know, this is not reality. It's an experiment, right? Reality is all the millennia yeah. that came before. before. And, yeah. the, and uh, I'm not in any way trying to romanticize or suggest that, you know, there's, you know, to glamorize that time, but rather to say, we behave as though this mass consumption <clears throat> is, is real and true. And it's not, it, it's an illusion. I mean, yes, it's really happening, but it's, it cannot, it's inconsistent with the rules of reality 
uh, yeah. from the way I was taught to believe and understand. Yes. <clears throat> the, I appreciate that, um, that you have described, you know, what my, my nation um, has done um, as being an expression of sovereignty because it really is. And the, um, the, the constant challenge though, is to keep that narrative, to keep that narrative alive because otherwise it's so easy to get caught back up in everything that tries to pull us down. And, you know, I, the, um, because all, although we're getting more um, better education, you know, across the board, um, there is still a lot of, well, racism you know, that goes on mm -hmm. and people do get pulled down. And um, then they start, um, you know, our own Kutunaka um, people, um, you know, they start to question, well, you know, what's, what is happening here? You know, that the, um, how we have gone to express our sovereignty, you know, is, is that really something, um, you know, that, that is real? And, you know, of course it is. It's the, this interruption that has happened once we recognize that this is simply an interruption and we have a very solid grounding still in who we are as Kutunaka in our cultural beliefs, that that is what's going to carry us forward beyond this interruption. Yeah, it's not it's not what um, you know all the other trappings that come along that come along trying to um, dismantle who we are as Kutunaka. I think <clears throat> what you're saying is so important in that we define reality regardless mm -hmm. of um, of the noise that we may hear in the narrative of um, of the dominant culture in the press and social media and all the different ways that, that we hold reality in our, in our culture, our cultural knowledge, the, the knowledge that we contain in our ancestral lines and that that is true and real. And, um, and we can hold that and, um, and see it for what it is <laughs> instead of, yeah. Uh, being convinced by these other voices. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So I think that we will uh, now move along to the question and answer this. This time has gone by so fast, but then of course it always does. Hey, when you're having a good time. <laughs> so Jameson, um, you know, I, I know that there are many questions in, that have been coming in. And um, so turn that over to you. Be. Yes, uh, I believe the first question we have here is someone's asking here if uh, you might talk about the context of the, re the reconciliation necessary within Indigenous nations and between generations and privileges. It's the question. Hmm. I'm sorry, can you can you say it again? I'm not sure I understand. Absolutely. I wonder if you might talk about the context of the reconciliation necessary within Indigenous nations and between generations and privileges, is the question. Hmm. Okay, so I appreciate that question. And so I'm going to speak to it briefly. Um, well, actually, I should start by asking Sophie, do you want to respond to that first? No, you, you go ahead. <laughs> okay. that, you started to put your thoughts together. That's good. Uh, Okay, so I think um, it's really important to acknowledge that indigenous communities are not monolithic, that they're diverse like all communities are. And sometimes we hear something, that, a narrative that I hear is, um, you know, folks from the dominant culture who are well-intentioned will say, well, you know, I, I wanna get involved, but I can't because all the native people don't agree on that topic. And so, um, you know, when you agree then I will be ready to, to get involved. And so often I will say, okay, you know, I'm in, a, I'm in the United States. And so a big issue we have here is gun control. And I'll often respond to that and say, well, when all the white people agree on what to do about gun control, then I'll get involved. Because we, and you smile because we know that that's, that's not how it works. It's also not how it works in indigenous communities because of course indigenous nations have a diversity of interests and, um, and you know, and positions, and um, and it's it's not monolithic. And so, you know, one of the ways that I think um, that good restoration can occur within nations, and I think this is what the question is asking, 
is through following traditional process um, and ceremony for, for seeking um, uh, reconciliation among people. And so that is a gift that, that is provided to us by our ancestors to be able to engage in um, restoration among ourselves as we're seeking um, to heal relationships or to address um, conflict um, within generations, between generations and within um, various interest groups. And so, and I think that's really important. You know, one thing that I've, I've talked about before is the Winti uh, religion that is practiced in Suriname, South America, where I've worked for many years. Um, the whole uh, family group will get together when there's conflict because, because there's a belief that if there's hate or conflict, it can actually result in, in death. And that you know, hate is strong enough to result in some in a death. So they get together and and work to resolve that with elders and even calling on the ancestors to engage in that. And mm-hmm. and that can feel really strange uh, to people from the Christian context, but it's very effective um, to engage in that ceremony because it's really including, you know, it, it's acknowledging that conflict. Um, spans generations. It's not just um, localized to an interpersonal relationship, right? It's actually part of a larger whole. And so I think um, much of our um, Native spirituality provides opportunities for us to engage in restoration and um, in growing together um, in conflict resolution. And I think that's a really important um, process to engage in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you for for bringing us to there, Sarah, in in answering this question because you know there there is the the um, the reality that we do have to that we do need to go through and and have the um, reconciliation you know with, within our families, within our communities, our nations, and nations with each other. Yes, you know there is that, and all you know much of that much of the sort of the um, the conflict right now is because of what what has happened to us but that's not but again you know going back to your timeline got to remember that this was just a little interruption so in order to deal with what we've what are what we're going through now we have to go back to the way that our you know what what is it that that was saved and brought forward for the for people today from our ancestors on how you know you you resolve conflict, how you deal with that, you know how families work with each other. That that is still there, and it's in you know maybe with with um, some families it, it's um, a little more. Um, it, it, it's it's not as strong, but it there are enough of us around that we can help that. And this is what, this is where our discussion was going to yesterday or the, the last couple of days when we were talking about, you know, the, um, our own legis- we're developing our own legislation in child and family protection. We were saying, yeah, we have enough of our own ways that we can bring forward mm-hmm. that. And this is what we rely on by the same thing in terms of the question that was brought up for reconciliation amongst indigenous people ourselves. Um, one of the the great um, sort of diversions that the federal and provincial government, um, you know, used for a while and used quite successfully in the whole treaty process, as was mentioned, I was the chief commissioner for the BC Treaty Commission for six years, and we we have been involved in the treaty process for for decades, and right from the beginning, the um, the very um, useful tool for the for the gov- the other gov- the other two governments was to say, okay, you need to go off and resolve your overlapping claims, you know, your, your, um, where you have shared territory and you're claiming the same territory. You figure out where that line is and then, then, then we'll talk and say, well, no, that's not the way it works. You know, <laughs> right. we, have, we have shared territory and we have territory that is, and in our case, it's Amakiskunaka and that's the way it is. And that's where you're gonna sit down and, and have the discussion with us. But it's that type of just that expression that um, that being sovereign, you know, that just do it kind of mentality mm-hmm. that you you exercise your sovereignty without letting you know all these other distractions come in. And I think that that applies as much to the larger political questions as it does to the reconciliation that needs to happen 
within families, within communities, and within nations themselves. Yeah. Thank you for that bricklaying for both of you and, and building all that context. Thank you very much. Uh, we have another question from uh, Dr. Paul Kingsbury, who is part of the SFU Faculty of Environment and Geography. And uh, he says, thank you for your very important and wonderful presentation, Dr. Sarah and Sophie. Could you please talk about how we might usefully activate Jesus's mandate to bring good news to the poor, liberty to the captives, freedom for the oppressed, page 209 in your excellent book, in predominantly secular places like university? Thanks for all your good work and words as well. So the first thing I have to make a correction and just say, um, I'm no doctor. Um, <laughs> I don't get to, I don't get to, own, uh, to take responsibility for that privilege. Um, although I did uh, engage in PhD studies, I didn't finish. So I'm, I'm just a person. Um, anyway, uh, so one of the things that, uh, talking about the mandate of Jesus, if you'll forgive me for just a minute, in a secular environment, you know, Jesus says um, in Luke, um, the spirit of God is upon me to bring good news to the poor, right? And he states the, the levels of his mandate. And so from my point of view, this is the mandate of, of every person that is following the Jesus way, whether um, Christian or, or secular, that the spirit of, of God is upon me. That spirit of life is upon me. That we don't say Jesus is different. Jesus is separate. Jesus can do that because Jesus is Jesus. No, that spirit of God is upon me to bring good news to the poor. That is my mandate. That is my responsibility to show up in every space with that mandate. The spirit of God is upon me. Why? Because I'm alive today. Because I am the descendant of my line. Because I am the representative today of my grandmother who lost her son and who, was, um, who, who had her own precious child taken away from her. And uh, she's gone, but I'm alive. How do I stand up for my people today? How do I stand up for all people today in defense of creation? I have the ability to do that because that is my mandate too. And uh, that is the mandate of, of everybody who is, who is following the Jesus way or the, path, the pathway of, of life. And I think that um, that is not uh, something you have to uh, believe in substitutional atonement in order to own that mandate. And I think that's the power of, um, of that message um, that is freedom from oppression that, uh, and, and Jesus speaks very clearly the message of Jubilee, which is to say a reordering of human systems with um, justice at the heart that um, it's released for prisoners and it is freedom, you know, it's freedom for the captive and it is sight for the blind. And who are the blind? The people who are burdened by privilege, who don't even see st systemic inequality because it's invisible to them as the beneficiaries of system systemic injustice. And this is what we have the ability within our bodies and ourselves to bring to every environment. And, you know, there are activists I work with who say, hey, you know, well, I, you know, every third Thursday I go and work on the doctrine of discovery. And I say, no, every day, in every way, um, with your family, with your friends, uh, the, the, the rusty door hinge at brunch, at the tennis club, if that's where your life is, or at the bowling alley, if that's where your life is, or at happy hour, um, anytime you're on a committee, how are you advancing the, the, the purpose of um, mutual de dependence in a closed system, because that is what will win the day. All of us showing up all the time and working collectively. Sophie, I, I wanted did, to ask you had anything, yeah. sorry. Um, the, when, when I, um, I hear like questions around the, um, the way of, of Jesus, and because I said I was raised in residential school and was a Catholic residential school, so I'm, I'm familiar. I, I can't quote any uh, passages from the Bible, but I'm familiar with it. But what I, what I have become very familiar with and what I know now is that the teachings of Jesus are the teachings of the creator, of, you know, regardless of, of where, you know, um, 
regardless of what you call the creator, there is a creator and the creator is that has is responsible for uh, has is responsible for creating all living things. In Ktunacha, we have a fundamental belief that khamis apikapsin is a basic value, and that's the life of all living things, not just humans, all living things, and that is what our responsibility is for the continued. Um, like we have, we have a covenant um, in our creation story. We have a covenant that we. Are we recognize that we were put here on this earth to to protect all living things for all time, and this is what you pass on. So it includes being um, like helping your neighbor, um, helping the poor, helping the sick, but it also talks about helping the grizzly bear when the grizzly bear is sick. It also talks about helping the trees, the water, the air, all of that, because our our doctrine is. And I know that with um, indigenous people the world over, that that is a very similar, similar belief. Continuing to put note on this mutual dependence and within a closed system and equality for all life, like that is such a powerful thing, especially in relation to continuing the work of our ancestors. Um, I believe this next question is very much in line with that. Um, Emmanuel asks, Anti, out of respect, Anti Sophie, I admire your enthusiasm and staying power to this cause. How would you encourage others that lose faith because change, if any, is so slow? Perpetrators go, perpetrators, excuse me, go unpunished while we still suffer racist acts and processes. Yes, it does get, um, the burden gets heavy. But again, you know, our teachings are, is that um, when the burden starts to get heavy, you turn to the person that is beside you that is there to help. Don't be afraid to ask for help. You know, I think that sometimes we, we're, you know, whether or, um, you know, what, whatever it is that, that we're, we're battling. Um, yeah, you know, the continued racism, the, 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 the stuff that our kids face in school you know, and just teaching our, our children to reach out, to make sure that there's support systems. We're all responsible for that, creating those support systems, to helping each other. And to, I think that as often as possible to, re, re, to bring forward the, the teachings of our ancestors, to bring forward, I know for us as Kdunecha, um, we have many songs. And when we have our ceremonies, we remind the young people, these are the songs that you can use when you're, when you're, you know, you're, you're being um, bullied. You know, these are, mm-hmm. these are, are this, this is what makes you, this is what gives you your purpose in life. And, mm-hmm. and this is where you can get your support. That's tough. I know that if you're, say, in the city. If you're not, I mean, it, it's easier for me because I'm here, I'm at home, you know, my feet every day touch the ground that my ancestors have always touched every day. But it's not the same for my granddaughter who's right now living in Toronto. You know, her feet touch the ground of other Indigenous people, but, you know, it's, it's still, it's difficult. I think that we, though, as um, just as people, there are everyone has, this, has similar needs, it doesn't matter, you know, from what, what part of the world that you come from, um, that there are ways that you can help each other. So we just look forward, we look, we look towards how we can help each other. And with, um, for like our indigenous people, remember, like always know who you are and where it is that your feet need to be touching that ground and no matter how hard it is, once in a while, get back there. Get back there and touch that ground. All right, would you have anything that you'd like to add to that question at all? Yeah, I, I would just, I'm looking, you know, it's hard when you're not face-to-face, but I would just want to say to, to the person that asked that question that you are precious. <laughs> And you are worthy and you are the, 
you are alive now. You are alive right now. You're in this amazing process of life. What a privilege to be alive. What a privilege to be alive, to survive um, the long lineage of your ancestors. What a privilege to be alive now, to be able to, to walk and, and breathe and live here in this earth. And, um, and that, that is, I don't know, for me, that's, that's everything because um, we are integrated in a system together and there is no, I mean, I don't know if this is helpful or not. Maybe it's depressing. There is no individual action that's going to move the needle. We have to work together. That's, that's all we've got. And I have to think about myself, you know, that I'm standing in time, you know, with my hands out, you know, like I'm, I'm reaching out to the one that will come after. How do I demonstrate courage to that one? And I'm reaching out to the one that came behind who has set up the the situation for me to be here. But now is my moment, I'm alive now. And what a privilege to be alive and uh, to represent my people in this world. And how can I best make the way for the one that will to come? And I I take hope from that, that I know the people that come after us will also be courageous and brave. And it's not up to me to complete this work. I am doing my part here in this, in this time. You both are such a worthwhile reminder. In this culture, it's so easy to get caught up in this. this is, it's all on you, onus on the individual. And I mean, colonial systems of concrete and the buildings that we're in, there's all separating of self. So I appreciate you both for giving such worthwhile reminders of, of what we're carrying on, the work that we're carrying on and walking in a good way on these lands and all beings on these lands. Thank you. I know we're I'm looking at the time here and we're just, just past 620 now and I wanna check in with both of you to ask you if you have time, capacity, energy to answer one more or would you like to close up? Yes, for me, I'll defer to Sophie. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, carry on. I know. <laughs> I know we have a we have a time frame, but sure. If there's another another uh, question, and then then I I realize we do have to uh, have to be looking at closing up. But I'm Ooh. I'm enjoying this. I love Sarah. Great. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, we have a question here from Audrey, and it said, asks, how do we deal with those who think the Christian message is man shall have dominion, and some people are superior and some are inferior, and that is God's will, in quotations. Hierarchy, hierarchy means sacred order. That's the question. Yeah, and, um, I, if you don't mind, Sophia, I'll take a stab at it. Um, uh, I, I just always return to, to the, the mandate of Jesus, and some of what I'm learning from Sophie in your words is to to just blast through. I don't need to engage all of that. I'm, I am here, I have dignity, and I know what is true, and that isn't. <laughs> you know, that, um, that, that is not the mandate or the message um, of Jesus. And that's not to say that it hasn't been the mandate and the message of the church which is a different entity altogether, but it, but it, isn't, uh, it, 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 it isn't the message or the mandate that, um, that, that Jesus represented, which was um, good news for the poor. And um, there has been, you know, there's been some, over the years, certainly when I was growing up, people have said, oh, you know, it really meant the poor in spirit, people who are discouraged. And it's just really not the case. I mean, Jesus was calling for, um, for Jubilee, which is complete reordering of systems. And so, and also, um, you know, what can I say? Uh, love and advocacy for the entire world and for the restoration of all creation um, that's, that's the message. And so, um, so this is part of, um, uh, rebuilding is saying, I don't need to spend my life energy engaging with those church institutions that are talking about that. I am going to do my own thing and work with other people who are willing to, um, engage in the good news, um, that I know, 
which is um, not in any way about hierarchy or discrimination. Um, and so, um, you know, part of our work together in the Dismelling the Doctrine of Discovery Coalition is to disengage from all of that and say, we're, we're following the spirit of life and creating uh, what we know is life-sustaining work for all of creation. And we're doing that on behalf of, um, of each other, all, all, <laughs> all of creation. And that's, we don't, and I'm not going to expend my life energy to, uh, to engage in, in all of that. I believe that from the time of creation, our, the, the, the fundamental principle of was very strong among all living things like a man, animals, everything. And um, it's only very, very recent that this whole idea, because you know, the idea that, was, that you, you described about uh, you know, some being greater than others, I mean that that comes from that papal bull, you know. That that was a lot of bull that somebody <laughs> somebody needed to deal with, and you know, there's that like, hey, we, you know, some of us need to be, you know, where we think that we're bigger than others, you know, and when we have, you know, we we need to have more power than others, and it just took off from there, and um, so I know that from all. The indigenous people, I mean, because at some point we are all indigenous. We all come from somewhere. Then we're indigenous. There's that common belief about the, the importance of life for all living things, the importance of Akhamis Atakapsin. So yeah, just plow on through. Some people need need that uh, need to feel that they're they're lorded over others. Well, <laughs> you know what happens there. Remember that the people that you meet on your way up, you're going to meet those same people on your way down. So you better be nice to them. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you both. I, I see so many, a couple, like, I think six or seven more questions here that I would love to ask you. And I'm sure people would love to hear the answers to. And and um, so maybe we'll keep moving on and, and close up here in this conversation today. And, and uh, I do want to say thank you so much, both of you, for your energy and time today. I, I raise my hands in gratitude for both of you. And it's hard to kind of be seeking advice and, and hearing from elders and knowledge keepers uh, in virtual spaces. But to have both of you be present in conversation today uh, means a lot to me. And I'm, I'm sure that all the 150 folks and and people who are, will be joining and watching this recording afterward. So thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, and thank you. I, I really appreciate this opportunity. I appreciate the, the opportunity that I, that I was given, uh, this gift that I was given in being introduced to Sarah and having an uh, opportunity to read her book and to continue to learn from her and to be able now, um, now it's my responsibility to carry on that knowledge, you know, to, to pass that on. Um, and so, yeah, I, I want to, for any that are listening, you know, we need to have our own discussion, sit down and talk about the impacts of um, the doctrine of discovery and just, you know, how we start, how we not start, because we've already started, how we continue to unpack that for the benefit of all future generations. So thank you very much for this opportunity. So yeah, Stefan. Thank you, Jameson. It's, it's been so wonderful to be in conversation with you and especially Sophie, thank you for um, it's just a privilege and an honor, actually, to get to be here in conversation with you. And I just look forward to, to knowing you more and, uh, and learning and growing, um, learning from you and carrying on your work um, to the extent that, that I can do that. And um, thank you, too, to um, Simon Fraser University. Such an amazing opportunity to be here. And I thank you. It's a humbling opportunity. And thank you for the opportunity to speak. After today's conversation, I'm, I'm ready to go outside and get my feet on the ground. <laughs> Absolutely. So I, I just want to also echo your words of thanks, Sarah, for SFU Public Square and the Resilience BC teams for their work on, on this event and uh, to Accurate Real Time for providing closed captioning. Um, stay tuned for a follow-up email with a recording and other resources from this event. And thank you all for joining us this evening. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your week. 
and uh, can find healing and, and knowledge from today's conversation as I, I did. So thank you.